And I felt this sense of something like doom uh, arising up in me. And then these words just popped into my head. And the words were, this civilization is finished. What we need is radical acceptance, radical surrender to uh, what has been, to what is, and in a certain sense, to what will be. Um, but paradoxically, what true radical surrender actually leads into is an incredible uh, empowerment and sense of freedom and sense of possibility. The other significance of the term Extinction Rebellion, of course, is that the sixth mass extinction is going on right now. We are extinguishing other species all the time, probably at the rate of about one every 10 minutes. Yes. Which means during this podcast, probably we've killed off about another five or six. As you mentioned, there's a lot that we can do locally, regionally, continentally, if possible, um, uh, larger movements. But there's a lot that we can do that gives our lives joy and meaning and value. And we're mm -hmm. doing the right thing because whether our, whether our species, Homo sapiens, goes extinct in... 10 years or 2 million years, it's probably going to be in that time frame. And 2 million years on a cosmic time frame is not that long. And so to, I put my faith in life, evolution, ecology. And so that allows me to no longer be freaked out by the bad news. It's like, well, yes, of course, unsustainable civilizations at some point aren't sustained. So I became aware of your work only in the last several months, actually, when I watched the, uh, uh, the Cambridge University piece uh, yes. at Churchill College, and then became aware of yours and Sam's uh, uh, book along the same right. lines, and, yeah. and then watched a few other uh, things of you on, on YouTube. Yeah. And so how do you find yourself languaging this time? What language tends to work for you? In terms of yeah so well th this there's this little catchphrase for which i've become a little bit well known which is this civilization is finished which really sums up a lot of it for me what i mean by that is that things have gone so far now that the only way we're going to be able to save ourselves is by changing everything extremely rapidly such that if we manage to do that in a way that avoids uh, an uncontrolled collapse event which I think is very unlikely, but still possible for us to do. Um, if we manage to do that, then nevertheless, what emerges will be in no meaningful sense the same civilization as the one we currently have. Exactly. So there is no question but that this way of life is going to end. The only question is whether it ends completely in absolute collapse or whether it collapses and something um, better and more viable and more local and so forth emerges from it, or whether we manage to go straight to that more viable, more local future without having to go through a collapse first. That's the, that's the only issue so far as humans are concerned, it seems to me, in this situation. So I think the phrase, this civilization is finished, sums it up quite neatly. So it's not saying civilization is finished, but this civilization is finished. We are not going to go on living in a way that resembles the way we are currently living. Yes, exactly. And um, one of the one of the mentors that I think we share, or at least people that we admire greatly, is Joanna Macy. And it's interesting because I got some pushback from a couple of participants in terms of the post doom, just the meme that the company that that label and. Um, and, you know, so I, I asked Joanna, I just called her up because I've done a lot of training with her over the years, mostly in the late 80s and 90s. And yeah. she said, she said, no, don't change that title. That's exactly what we need. Uh, that's what our times uh, call for. You were born in the 60s. Um, I was born in 58. You know, we were born into a time when the expectation was perpetual progress, that things were getting better. And then at yeah. some point in time, most of us, well, all of us in this series had a... Um, troubling awakening or whatever, sometimes fast, sometimes uh, gradual. How did you come to just a little bit of your own journey? Actually, this is the heart and soul of this particular series is people sharing mm -hmm. thought leaders rather than giving sort of their, their teaching points, which they're famous for. Um, uh, and anybody listening to this, if you haven't uh, watched uh, Rupert's presentations that I referred to earlier, please do so. They're absolutely excellent. But how did you awaken to this? How did you come to this understanding of civilizational decline, potential yeah. 
uh, extinction, this sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll ease my way into that. Firstly, by saying I think the title Post Doom is interesting, a couple of meanings that it has to me. Uh, one is that the when one realizes that in some pretty fundamental way uh, we're fucked, uh, then one uh, has a great sense of a doom, but one doesn't necessarily stay in that sense. I think this is what you were mentioning a minute ago, Michael. One, in some sense or another, moves through that, and that could be a meaning of uh, post-doom. Um, another meaning, though, is that it's very important for me to distinguish uh, the position that I occupy from the position of so-called doomers, uh, those who say um, we are completely doomed. It doesn't seem to me that that's true. And my main reason for saying that is quite simply that we don't know. We just do not know what's going to happen. There are lots of things we know about what's going to happen, but so many more things that we don't know. And that basic attitude of uncertainty or unknowing, which in the final analysis is a kind of spiritual uh, attitude, mm -hmm. um, is an attitude that is also strongly supported by the work that I've done jointly with Nassim Taleb, about taking a precautionary perspective and being honest enough to own up to the vast uncertainties that we're in the midst of. And those who say, oh, it's doom we're doomed, there's nothing we can do, or even someone like my friend and colleague, Jim Bendel, who says that, uh, while he doesn't say at all, there's nothing we can do, he does say this civilization is bound to collapse. Um, I think that that is too knowing, it's too assuming of an attitude of certainty that I think we're not really entitled to. And I think that attitude of certainty is often what's got us into trouble in the first place. Mm. So you could characterize my position as a post-doom position in the sense also that I went through a process of being incredibly, incredibly pessimistic for a while. And in many ways I still am, yeah. I just think it's realistic. Um, but uh, I'm not in a position of thinking we are doomed, let alone there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, so in that sense, I think it's important to be post-doom. Now, in terms of Joanna Macy, yeah, she's been a, a teacher and a trainer and a, and a, a guru, I suppose, uh, of mine for uh, for many years. Uh, and I, I was privileged to meet her again um, recently, uh, which was, well, again, it was frankly a spiritual experience. I think she's at an extraordinary point in her powers at this late, at this late point um, in her life. And the, when I worked with her some years ago, um, it, a crucial learning that I had from that work was coming to understand that there's always something meaningful that you can do. Um, and that is a guiding uh, light for me. What, what, whatever uh, doom uh, awaits us or doesn't await us, there's always something you can do to, to do things that are right, to make things uh, less awful uh, and so on. So I've been trying for many, many years like many people probably listening to this podcast, I've been trying for many years to do the right thing and to make things better. And I've worked in worked a lot in organizations such as the, the Green Party uh, in this country, in the UK, to try to do that and had some bits of success here and there along the way. But to come to your question directly about um, when things turned a different kind of corner for me, a few years ago, I happened actually to be delivering Green Party leaflets uh, not far from where I live. Uh, and as I walked through past these gardens, many of which had um, uh, rubbish in them or they had um, old bits of uh, broken down machinery or they were incredibly, incredibly manicured and there was very little space for nature. Well, garden after garden seemed to, for a while, while I was on this particular street, seemed, I can still see it in my head, seemed to speak to me quite powerfully. And I felt this sense of something like doom uh, arising up in me. And then these words just popped into my head. And the words were, this civilization is finished. Uh, and I, I felt a bit of a sense of shock. Um, I finished my leafleting just about and made my way home and then I had to sort of stop and, and think and ponder for a long time. Sure. And I, yeah. And I realized that for years, really, I'd been keeping at bay a sense that there was something hopeless about what we were trying to do in terms of keeping this civilization going, which is often what people mean by sustainability, by the way, which is one of the reasons I think the term sustainability yeah, is not much use to us anymore. Um, so I pondered for a while and felt very glum for quite a while. And then, um, as is my wont, I found myself starting to, to write. 
uh, and I wrote a piece called uh, This Civilization is Finished, and the piece gradually um, expanded. Uh, and I started sharing it with a few friends, and I said to them, please do not publicize this piece, do not share it, etc. This is different from stuff I've done before, and I still feel very uncertain yes. about it. Uh, and I passed it to various friends and various uh, uh, colleagues, and I was really surprised they the reaction that they had to it, which was very positive. People said to me, Rupert, th this is, Rupert, this is really important stuff. You need to yeah. share this. Yeah. And I was like, no, I don't want to share it. And I had two reasons for not wanting to share it. And the first reason was I was worried that I'd be attacked as a defeatist, yeah. which is what I had said myself, for example, uh, 10 years earlier to the, the Dark Mountain uh, people, uh, Paul Kings North and uh, yeah. Dougal Pine, who I'm now quite an admirer of, and I, I think they uh, were ahead of their time, although I, I still think that, like Jem Bendel, they have given up a little bit too much on our chances of, uh, of making, through, making it through what's coming without um, uh, a Megadeth-style um, collapse. The second reason that I didn't want to share the piece was that I, would worry, I was worried that I would demoralize people, that the only effect that this would have, if it had any effect, would be that people were... Um, upset and gave up and so forth. I felt that they, they were simply doomed. Um, so I resisted sharing it. Then finally, um, one of my uh, um, colleagues, uh, actually from the Green Party, um, who'd come to somewhat similar conclusions by himself, uh, said to me, look, Rupert, why don't you publish this anonymously? You could publish a version of it anonymously and just sort of as, a, just kind of put a, put a flag out there, uh, yeah. fly a balloon, um, yeah. see how it goes. So I thought, all right, we'll give that a shot. Published it anonymously. Again, reaction um, quite positive. So um, a few months later, I was invited to speak um, at a conference, um, and I thought, I'm going to give it a first try. Uh, I'm going to give it a public airing. I was incredibly nervous, Michael, at this first public I airing, but I was putting my name to it. Um, again, I thought uh, I would be um, attacked, and that at best, I would demoralize people. So it's not at all what happened. Um, Many people said they found it um, inspiring, original, even liberating. And that's been my experience almost ever since. I've had so little pushback on this work, which is astonishing when you consider its apparent radicalism. And when you consider that I've been viciously attacked in the past for various other things that I've said that I thought were much less um, extreme or full on. Um, many, many people, including students, including young people, have said things like, this is liberating because finally someone here is telling the truth. Um, finally, I feel like um, we can have a real conversation. Finally, we can bring our fears into the open. Yeah. This is what I've also done through my think tank, uh, Facing Up to Climate Reality, um, is the name of the book that uh, my think tank, Greenhouse, have recently put out. And our idea in Facing Up to Climate Reality is that we have to look honestly and directly um, at the crisis, not shy away from it, not pretend to be optimistic in ways that um, uh, are um, untenable, and that we then need to talk. We need to talk to each other uh, about our real fears and about what we think the situation actually is, which is one of the reasons I'm glad to be doing these kind of uh, podcasts. And that was the backdrop for um, uh, a year or two later, um, my encounter with the Extinction Rebellion before it was uh, launched. And I was so thrilled by the idea of Extinction Rebellion because I thought, here are some people who are finally um, not just trying to do what I've been doing, which is telling the truth. The first demand of the rebellion is to tell the truth. Right. Here are some people who are actually willing to put their bodies on the line and take sufficient action to rise up to uh, this challenge without necessarily any, expect any expectation of being able to win, uh, but just because uh, it's the dignified thing to do, it's the right thing to do, and because we've got to give it a shot. So yeah, that would be a, a short version of how I got into this, that uh, I've for years uh, struggled through relatively conventional channels, um, found my something breaking through into my consciousness, which said, no, this isn't good enough. Um, wrestling for a long while about what to do about that, gradually putting the stuff out there, being surprised over and over again until now, it doesn't surprise me anymore, that people react so positively and so strongly to it that it's had by far the most positive vibe of anything that I've ever done. Um, and then that feeding into the work I've done in recent years with Greenhouse and most recently with Extinction Rebellion, which is 
really giving my life a, a lot of meaning and giving me a little bit of hope that um, it's not all over till it's over. Um, I think that the success of Extinction Rebellion in the UK this year, especially uh, in and after April, is the first real empirical reason that we have for quite a long time for thinking that we're not doomed to collapse just yet. Yeah, yeah. My way of holding this um, that I found emotionally, spiritually um, uh, nourishing is to see, it, I, it just it just came to me actually a week and a half ago at Ghost Ranch, New Mexico, which is a, that doom is the midpoint that uh, people avoid the door of doom, uh, you know, because it has over the top of it, W-A-S-F, we are so fucked, as you said. Mm -hmm. But, and then they often go through stages of grief, getting to that, yeah. that place. But if they can get yeah. to the place of going through the, the uh, denial and, you know, bargaining, anger, acceptance, and then what Paul Chaferka calls finding the gift, that finding the gift, it really is the doorway that if you allow yourself to go through that door of despair or door of doom, yeah, a whole universe of, of possibility opens up and I see them as spheres of gratitude that allow us to be engaged in action, but we're doing so from a place of deep trust in evolution, deep trust in life, mm. deep trust in yeah. ecology. Uh, I, yeah. Because I'm, a, I'm a, an eco-theologian, I speak about ecology as the heart of theology and I travel all over North America delivering that kind of a message. William Catton, author of the book Overshoot, which many of us consider the most important book of the 20th century, I, I see this ecological grounding, and there's a distinction that, that Catton makes between homo colossus, which is where each of us uses 20 to 50 times the resources and energy. It seems to me that homo colossus is destined for extinction, that it, it's so unsustainable. That doesn't yeah. necessarily mean the extinction of homo sapiens, although it could mean that as well. I mean, that is a possibility, especially if we've triggered self-reinforcing feedbacks, um, yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. But, um, but nonetheless, as you mentioned, there's a lot that we can do locally, regionally, continentally, if possible, um, uh, larger movements. But there's a lot that we can do that gives our lives joy and meaning and value. And we're doing the right thing because whether our, whether our species, Homo sapiens, goes extinct in 10 years or 2 million years, it's probably going to be in that time frame. And 2 million years on a cosmic time frame is not that long. And so to, I put my faith in life evolution ecology and so that allows me to no longer be freaked out by the bad news it's like well yes of course unsustainable civilizations at some point aren't sustained and yet i have uh i have more energy and enthusiasm and joy frankly in life trying to do the things where i can make a difference yeah um, and i'm wondering if this has has uh, has this big picture has the universe story or epic of evolution or you know uh uh green history big green history have has mm. that informed you or supported you in your work at all so uh, i agree with the the vast majority of what you've just said michael and, if, and there's so much i could say positively in response um in terms of the universe story though not so much i'm an admirer of uh, of thomas berry's work and of others who have pointed us in this direction, but it, that's not so meaningful to me. For me, what is more significant really um, uh, is a, a spiritual orientation to what's happening, which really centers in uh, the present uh, and in being really present to uh, what is, being willing to, being able to experience joy in the present, in the knowledge that it may be, uh, and in some sense necessarily is, uh, fleeting, uh, and being clear also about a certain sense, which I'm trying to develop in my work at the moment, a certain sense in which um, the present actually is fine, just as it is, uh, which seems an extraordinary thing to say when the context is that everything's going to uh, shit, apparently, and it's going to be very difficult to stop it. Yes. But you know, if we really are willing to look in the eye what's happening and that's what my talks and books in recent years have been about if we're really 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 willing to look it in their face um, that creates or unleashes an extraordinary power in us uh, to do things which are um, unprecedented of all kinds but including the kind of things that extinction rebellion 
uh, is doing and calling upon us to do. And in that sense, when enough of us are in that situation, well, actually, we have the capability, it seems to me, uh, until we have no capability left. We have the capability to turn around situations which might seem impossible to turn around and create new possibilities and hopes which might seem not just unrealistic, but even absurd. Uh, and that's the thing which gives me um, the most strength and power and hope. And that's what I'm going to be uh, talking more about and teaching more about in the coming year. So that's a little trailer there. You heard it here first. <laughs> um, what I'd also like to say uh, is that I couldn't agree more with you about the importance of uh, grief and other associated uh, emotions, uh, which I've written about in my philosophical work. Uh, grief is present because we love, because we care. Uh, and sometimes it's very painful, um, but it's far better than the alternative, which is not feeling it. Yeah. Uh, and grief again, um, and similarly actually, um, uh, terror and other profound emotions, potentially give us um, extraordinary um, strength and power. There is an enormous mental health crisis coming. You think yes. there's bad mental health right now in the United States, in the United Kingdom. You ain't seen nothing yet. There's an enormous mental health crisis coming as more and more people wake up to what we've done to the planet, what we've done to our children. But this mental health crisis could be the making of us in eco-psychological terms and in the kind of terms that Joanna Macy teaches, it is necessary for us to be feeling these painful emotions. That's part of what it is to be truly alive now and part of what it is to awaken. And if we do really do awaken and really do feel those emotions fully, they impel us towards action. That's what the word emotion means, right? It doesn't have the, the concept of motion nested in it by accident. Um, so <laughs> oh, I like that. Yeah. So the grief that, uh, that we feel for our planet, for our children, for ourselves, for that matter, because I'm uh, still young enough to be uh, pretty damn afraid of what my old age is going to be like. Yeah. That kind of grief can, uh, in the same way as I was describing a, a few moments ago when I was talking about uh, facing reality head on, it's the same thing, really. Grieving properly, grieving deeply is ultimately facing reality head on. And you pass through these stages mm -hmm. of grieving. Um, that grief can give us the power to radically change the future. So if we really grieve uh, in the present, that can unleash a profoundly different future. And once again, it seems to me that in the great darkness of our time, there is enormous hope in that. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's excellent. You know, the, the word hope is one that I find that there's a lot of... Um, diversity of opinion, let's just say that. To say, is there hope? Well, is there liquid? Well, yes, but there's some liquids that'll sustain you and some liquids that'll kill you. It's really important to distinguish what it is that gives us hope because uh, to my mind, the moral issue of our time is doing everything we can to shift from the anti-future systems and behaviors and actions that we individually and collectively have been doing just because we're part of this system yeah. uh, uh, to, sh to doing what we can to transform and to, to hopefully catalyze larger transformations of pro-future action, behavior, policies, governance, economics, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, it, hope is not a neutral word, it seems to me. But it's not in a it's not inherently a positive word. So no, you know. no, no, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Hope, the crucial question is what are you hoping for, right? So as I implied before, if what you're hoping for is the continuation of life much as we currently know it, then that's an extremely dangerous kind of thing to have guiding you. Uh, and anything which kind of makes one think that it's gonna be possible to keep that going a while longer, should be regarded as, uh, as hopium, uh, a dangerous drug to be uh, uh, eliminated uh, at all costs and as rapidly as possible. Now, what we need is, uh, is a realistic hope, which has to be what Jonathan Lear calls a, a radical hope, a hope that gives up the things that we were previously hoping for. 
and it has to be also, as Rebecca Solnit and uh, Chris Johnston and Joanna Macy have uh, spoken of, uh, an active hope. Yes. What that basically means is if you're just sitting around kind of wishing things in your head, that isn't really hoping at all. And that's, again, at best, kind of a preparation for something, and at worst, a dangerous substitute for facing up to reality. Our hope is expressed, it seems to me, quite clearly and plainly in what we actually do. Um, and that's why I would urge uh, listeners to this podcast sooner or later to uh, start actually doing uh, something. Uh, it's, uh, you have to go through a process of, uh, of, of grieving, of thought, and so on and so forth when you're coming across these kinds of uh, uh, thoughts um, uh, and going into them deeply. But if you just stay in that, that that's pointless and, and indeed um, um, catastrophic, both for you personally uh, and for the broader society. Ultimately, our hope needs to be out there in stuff that we do in our community, um, uh, in the wide world, uh, in the political realm, or at the very least in reorganizing our own lives. Yeah, yeah, well put. You know, one of the other things that I've only learned about in the last four or five years is the rise and fall of previous civilizations. You know, what is it about unsustainable civilizations that makes them unsustainable? And yeah. how are they different from uh, uh, more or less sustainable cultures that honor primary reality, the biosphere, as a greater thou yeah. rather than a lesser it? Yeah. Uh, did you see that BBC piece uh, back in February? I think Luke Kemp, uh, are, are we on the road to civilizational collapse? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know Luke. I thought it was very useful. Yeah, good. Yeah, I did too. Because uh, previously my exposure had been through people like John Michael Greer, you know, his, his yeah. popularizing of Toynbee and Spangler and Vico and others. Yeah. But those patterns. And again, that's one of the things that allows me to be at peace with the contraction that we're currently in and as passionate as ever about being engaged in whatever transformational work I can do at yeah. whatever scale, you know, I can, I can do that. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious, have you ever had the sense, this is a question that Connie wanted to make sure that I, I asked the various guests in this podcast series. Um, many of us have had to restory the past as well as our sense of the future. And I'm curious if you've had any if onlys, like if only humanity had done X by this time, then all this bad stuff wouldn't be happening. Mm -hmm. Or, or it, has yeah. your reinterpretation of the past moved more, perhaps along the lines of inevitability? Yeah. Well, on the one hand, I think it's unavoidable to have many of these if onlys, and there are so there are so many. You can go way, way back and uh, talk about if only. Um, certain kind of evolutionary turns uh, hadn't been uh, made. One of the things I like to do uh, nowadays uh, is to um, think about ourselves in comparison with other um, animals. Uh, and I like to think especially about animals from which we think I can, from which I think we can learn. Uh, and I think there are animals from which we can truly learn. I don't just mean sort of be um, in some um, uh, in some way inspired by or um, or struck by or let alone amused by or something. I mean, literally, we should learn from them. We should take them as, in a certain sense, uh, a, a kind of role model or as offering us some possibilities, some paths less traveled that perhaps should be more traveled. Um, and the two species I've been most interested in this way in recent times um, have been uh, bonobos, um, and well, not and, and also not just a species, but a whole order, the cetaceans, the, the whales and dolphins, but especially the, the social uh, whales and dolphins. Yes. And I think they are uh, enormously um, inspiring in various ways. When you look at the, the ways in, in which bonobos settle um, disputes, for example, uh, the way that, that love and sex play uh, such a, a central role in their um, culture because that's what it is that yeah. they and cetaceans both have cultures it's yes. clear that we have to use that word now when you look at the at some of the remarkable um capacities for self-sacrifice and fellow feeling and altruism and so on uh, among uh, cetaceans and of course we have many of those capacities ourselves but some of theirs seem to go uh, even further and that's something i've been writing about again in my philosophical work recently then one does kind of wonder oh, if only uh, our evolutionary path had somehow managed to encompass parts of their paths. Um, 
But then I think what one actually has to do with that is see what we can ins be inspired by that uh, uh, looking forward and going forward and what we can actually learn and adopt in the future. And also, um, there's one more thing here, which I think is really, really crucial, which is that if it ever does look like we actually are going to be extinct, it seems to me that we have a very great responsibility to try uh, all we possibly can not to take other species uh, with us. And I know that's obvious, but I want to say in particular, not to take with us other species such as bonobos and the cetaceans uh, and elephants and so forth. These species which have these immense uh, capabilities which are comparable in, in many ways to our own and in some ways superior to our own. Um, yeah. So that's one way that I uh, look back. Then much more recently, obviously, one can look at, uh, at paths not taken um, politically or at paths um, uh, not taken um, um, uh, industrially or technologically or ecologically. Then again, that works the other way around uh, as well. I like to uh, dwell in some of my talks um, on some of the ways in which we have, um, in which things could have been even worse. Um, We've been so reckless in our industrialization and our adoption of uh, technology. And this again comes back to the precautionary principle and the way we haven't upheld it. We've been so reckless that it's really pure chance uh, that we haven't got ourselves into the kind of desperate position that we're now in sooner. Uh, so one example of that is um, in terms of refrigerator coolants, as you probably know, the refrigerator uh, coolants that uh, we've used for a long time uh, turned out to be uh, extremely dangerous to the ozone layer. Mm -hmm. um, but it could have been even worse. If we'd have used uh, bromine um, as uh, a refrigerator uh, coolant, um, we would have probably have destroyed the ozone layer almost completely before we even realized what we were doing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just kind of, that really, that really shows one something about the, this, the, the speed, scale and recklessness of techno-industrial civilization. But you know, at the end of the day, Michael, again, my attitude on this comes back to our placement in the present. And at the end of the day, all these what ifs uh, are of very little um, help to us, really. Yes. Um, and what we actually need to do is to accept uh, where we are, um, while, of course, learning um, from past mistakes uh, and reconcile ourselves um, with it. Um, Harvey Jackins of uh, co-counseling had this very intriguing idea uh, about um, the uh, major famous philosophical problem of free will, right? Do we, do we have free will or are we determined? And, and Jackins' proposed solution to this problem, um, a solution which I find myself quite attracted to these days, is he said, the past was determined, in the future you're free. So he bifurcates it yeah, from yeah. the present. Suggest yeah. that in looking back on the past, you take up the stance of it couldn't have been otherwise. But in looking to the future, you take up the stance of radical freedom. Yeah, that's think, excellent. Yeah, I think something like that, uh, whether or not it's correct, and I think it may well be in a certain important sense correct, but whether or not it's strictly speaking correct, I think something like that is the kind of attitude that we ought to cultivate now. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. In fact, I found a distinction that David Sloan Wilson uh, has offered between practical truth and factual truth. That practical truth are beliefs that we have that if we act as if they're true, produce great food yeah. in our lives. Whether it's ontologically true or not, I don't know, but I can't think of a more a practically useful way to live than to assume that everybody did the best they could given what they had yeah. to work with, including yeah. our species in the past is the past. Yeah. And here we are now, what choices can we make? What decisions yeah. can we make? What relationships can we forge that can possibly lead to something healthy for the future? I think that's quite right. And by the way, this also chimes in with the attitude that Extinction Rebellion have, which is a very interesting one, which is Extinction Rebellion, we're a very, very radical group. Well, actually, we're not really radical at all. All we want to do is to, uh, is to survive and have a good time. But, you know, but that's now completely <laughs> radical. Uh, uh, we're a very radical group by the standards of our uh, insane uh, civilization. Um, but um, we take up a, 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 a much less sort of oppositional and certainly a much less angry stance than many past uh, radical groups. And the attitude we try to cultivate is, look, we're all um, in this together now in a quite meaningful uh, sense. 
Um, it won't do very much good for us to kind of beat each other up about the situation. What we try, need to try to do is to forge together an emergency uh, response, um, because that's what you do in an emergency. You don't go on uh, waffling about uh, uh, the past and berating each other. You put your hands together to the grindstone or whatever it is. Uh, and try to uh, try to get through it. And I think this is part of the power of Extinction Rebellion, that, that uh, it's quite an exciting kind of move away from the very widespread culture of kind of uh, shaming, naming, blaming, uh, that you get so much, for example, on, on social media, uh, and trying to encourage something more positive, where it's not about kind of berating people, for example, for their individual lifestyles that the system has landed them in, but thinking how collectively we can make the most intelligent response to this crisis that will define us and define the rest of our lives. Yes, yes, exactly. So um, another question that we're asking all the participants in this uh, series is around just your, how you hold impermanence and death. One of the things that I found deeply inspiring about William Catton's book, Overshoot, as I mentioned earlier, is his generosity of soul, his sense that any tool-making, symbolic, speech-using animal probably would have gone this route. So I found myself feeling compassion for our species in a way that I frankly didn't uh, until reading that book. Mm. But around impermanence and death, uh, I know for myself and my wife and others, uh, holding death as inevitable, as necessary, as no less sacred than life has been core to our own spiritual path. Yeah. Uh, are there ways of thinking about, you know, your own mortality and our species mortality that you found particularly helpful or you just, you just not think about it much? Oh, no, no, sure. I think about it. I deliberately um, bought a house uh, near a cemetery, which I pass through almost every day, which is a wonderful uh, experience and focuses the mind. Yeah, so I'm uh, among other things a practicing Buddhist, and I think that Buddhism has a very profound teaching in this area. I've also been uh, influenced again by Joanna Macy. The thing I'd like to say, which, which might be new to some of your listeners about this question, uh, is this, that I think that a, an absolutely crucial reason why in the appalling crisis and emergency of these times, we need to focus on the unavoidability and the sacredness of death is that we must be clear that the project to try to endlessly prolong the lives of human beings, and in particular, the lives of the ultra-rich uh, elite, um, transhumanist wannabes and so forth, um, is a catastrophic project uh, in juxtaposition with the emergency uh, that we're in. And that we really ought to be thinking, and uh, thankfully the climate school strikers and Greta Thunberg have really focused our minds on this. We really ought to be thinking constantly, of course, about future generations, including uh, our own children who are already um, alive. And there will be no place on earth, even in the best scenario for those children, um, if those who want to prolong their lives uh, forever get their way. Right. Uh, you know, the, the, the desire to fill up um, the earth with the people who are already on it is tantamount to a desire to uh, not uh, provide any room for children, to not provide any room for future generations. And it's particularly horrendous that people are investing money and in trying to prolong their lives in these ways and saving their skulls and all this kind of stuff at a time when we're going to be incredibly short of energy and when it's going to be very difficult for, for most of our children across the world probably to survive at all. So that, I think, is possibly the single most important aspect of this question right now in terms of the actual politics and ecology of the world. We need to accept the facticity of our own deaths because we need now more than at any other time in history to provide some space and some kind of possibility for life for those who are younger than ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Well, coming back to building on that, but also coming back to something you shared earlier in terms of uh, the, the, the moral imperative to do what we can to ensure that other life forms beyond humans yeah. 
the best possibility of surviving. Um, my wife, Connie Barlow, is one of North America's leading point people in terms of assisted migration, the assisting of oh, trees yes. in, mm. uh, in, in migrating north or poleward uh, faster than animals can move their seeds. Uh, it turns out that hundreds, ultimately thousands of species of uh, plants uh, will go and trees will go extinct unless humans assist them in yep. migrating. Uh, yep. I, I really see the shift from human centeredness to life centeredness as the fundamental distinction between sustainable uh, and yep. unsustainable culture. Yeah, absolutely. We have to radically overcome um, any narrow uh, anthropocentrism. Uh, anthropocentrism should devolve, should devolve into and dissolve into uh, ecocentrism because we don't exist at all anyway without the, the rest of uh, ecology. Uh, and yeah, this point about assisted migration is a very, is a very uh, strong one, a very clear one. So in winding this conversation down, Rupert, I've, I'd love to have you um, compare and contrast, like the, the other sort of major people that have contributed to this um, post-doom consciousness, uh, uh, some recent writers, Jim Bendel, of course, Catherine Ingram, and some others. How do you see your work uh, uh, similar to and distinct from theirs? Yeah. So one person who is a, a real inspiration to me is Roy Scranton, yes. uh, who I think was far-seeing and also is a particular inspiration to me because of his uh, philosophical uh, orientation, which I really like. Of course. Uh, in terms of people who, are, who have been writing stuff uh, recently, Jem Bendel is, is uh, someone whose work I think is very important. Uh, Jem and I are uh, friends and uh, colleagues, and there's an awful lot that we uh, agree on, and we, we've done work together, and there'll be more of that. Um, the main disagreement between us, which I've expressed in a little post that you can find on, uh, on Medium if you want to uh, read it. Uh, the main disagreement between us is that I think, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that he is too sure of himself in thinking that collapse is uh, certain. Um, I think that uh, if you look at the evidence, um, collapse seems overwhelmingly uh, probable. Although, again, even if it does happen, I'm uncertain that it will happen within the kind of 10, 10 year time frame uh, that Jim um, proposed when he wrote his deep adaptation paper uh, last year. Um, it seems to me that there's just too much that we don't know, including, for example, the possibility that there may be unforeseen uh, natural uh, feedbacks which counteract some of the feedbacks that are currently going on, the horrendous feedbacks in the Arctic, for example. And also, it seems to me that we do have at least some reason, especially since the birth of Extinction Rebellion, to think that we are starting to get a, a reaction of uh, serious enough um, scale uh, and uh, poise uh, to our disastrous trajectory that we might be able to uh, change that trajectory before it's uh, impossible to avoid uh, a massive collapse with, uh, with billions uh, probably um, dying. So that's my key disagreement uh, with, uh, with Jem. Um, in terms of Catherine, my disagreement is more radical. Um, I think that some, uh, some, Jem sometimes goes a little bit beyond uh, the evidence uh, in making his claims to know what's gonna happen uh, to our society. Um, with Catherine, I think she goes way beyond uh, uh, that evidence, and I really think that it's um, it's troubling to um, to make it sound as though uh, human extinction um, is certain when I think that that's very very far from uh, certain. Um, it seems to me, for example, that if you have some kind of massive global collapse uh, uh, event. Um, then it's still quite likely that um, isolated uh, bands, perhaps in, uh, in parts of the world which are um, uh, at present very cold, such as Antarctica even, uh, as Lovelock has suggested, um, could survive that. And certainly we don't know that they won't survive. And we know that uh, at earlier points in our evolutionary history, there were times when there were very, very few pre-humans, and nevertheless they uh, survived and went on to become numerous, all too numerous. Um, yeah. So uh, it seems to me that, um, uh, that, that I, I've seen absolutely no convincing argument at all um, that we are certain to go um, extinct. And I think that that really is a kind of doomer position which is, which is troubling and potentially dangerous. In terms of the name Extinction Rebellion, which some people have queried, the point of that name is twofold really. Um, the, the idea in Extinction Rebellion is we are ourselves potentially at risk of extinction. And I think, um, tragically, that can no longer be ruled out. 
Um, I, th I think it's not necessarily particularly likely, but it's, it's now got to be considered as a possibility. And as I say, I think it is kind of somewhat likely, tragically, that we are going to face a massive uh, collapse and probably a significant uh, uh, die off unless we do something completely extraordinary. The other significance of the term Extinction Rebellion, of course, is that the sixth mass extinction is going on right now. We are extinguishing other species all the time, probably at the rate of about one every 10 minutes. Yes. Which means during this podcast, probably we've killed off about another five or six, which is just so uh, heartbreaking and, and um, awakening uh, a fact. So, yeah, as we've been saying, this is not just about human beings uh, at all. This is much, much uh, bigger than that. And we need to be as big uh, as it is. I, I like to think of the stance that I'm taking as a kind of... Um, as a very honest one um, and a realistic one, but one which is kind of balanced between on the one side um, being uh, overly optimistic, as I think far too many of us were for far too long, and on the other side being overly pessimistic and doomy, as uh, at times I think Jim is and certainly I think Catherine is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my own sense is, that, again, coming back to that distinction between practical truth and factual truth, for me, it's just really useful emotionally to be at peace with the worst case scenario. I'd sort of do yeah. that in, in ver yeah. invariably. So that I'm at peace with the possibility that our species, well, it will go extinct, whether it's a million, two million years from now, or 10 or 20 or 30, 40 years from now. But I'm at peace with that possibility so that it has no power over me. So yes. I don't, I don't, I'm not terrorized by that. Yeah. And yet I find paradoxically that that not only doesn't have me throw up my hands and say, well, what the hell can anybody do? Yeah. I'm more engaged. I mean, I have an eight year old Absolutely. granddaughter. Yeah. Um, my youngest yeah. daughter is considering the possibility of getting pregnant. And for a while I was terrified about that. Yeah. And, and then I began thinking that, you know, if, okay, let's paint worst case scenario, which is we go extinct pretty soon. Well, what I want one of the last generations like my own daughter to not have that mother child bond, even in difficult times. And so I, again, I put my faith in, in evolution in life in time. Mm. Uh, That's and, a tricky one. You know, I, I'm not in the position that you're in there. I, I'm inclined to think that if I was in your position, my attitude would be a bit different. Uh, when people ask me, I do urge them to think very carefully before bringing a, a child into this world right now for more than one reason. One reason is you need to think about the, what, you're, what the life of that child is going to be like. Uh, another reason is you need to think about the, the extra footprint, the extra burden on our overpressed world. Very, very difficult um, questions. But look, on the fundamental point, I completely agree with you. And, and the line that I'm seeking to take now, which can sound very paradoxical, but I think is profoundly true, and I'm hoping, as I say, to explore this in the, in the philosophical and, and frankly, spiritual work that I'm going to be doing over the next year, is that what we need is radical acceptance, radical surrender to uh, what has been, to what is, and in a certain sense, to what will be. Um, but paradoxically, what true radical surrender actually leads into is an incredible uh, empowerment and sense of freedom and sense of possibility. Yes. Um, a real uh, sense of uh, possibility, a grounded sense of possibility, but a very expansive sense of possibility. So I would urge, uh, paradoxical though it might sound, I would urge listeners to consider the possibility that through radical surrender and everything that that involves, including grief and so on and so forth, there is a route to a kind of empowerment which enables us to believe that we can still radically change the future uh, and that is why um, I am not prepared to say that collapse is, uh, is inevitable. I think to say that is, is in a certain sense giving up on ourselves and giving up on human possibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think I might differ there in the sense that I think that uh, 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 this, the collapse of Homo Colossus is inevitable okay, and yes, sorry sorry yeah no i don't think we're really differing um uh i'm when i when i talk about 
the non-inevitability of collapse. Remember that I'm taking for granted that this civilization, which I think right, is your right. Homo Colossus, yes. has to go. Yes. The question, the the, the the possibility that I'm holding on to, and I don't think it's self-delusion to hold on to it. I think it's 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 realism and actual active hope and the and the expansive sense of possibility that comes from radical surrender. The possibility I'm holding on to is that that transition, that transition from this catastrophic civilization to a civilization that can last may not have to be mediated by a massive collapse event involving a very, very large numbers of, of human deaths. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, if you ever uh, uh, read uh, Catton's Overshoot, I'd love to have a conversation with you specifically about that. But I just, I love your heart. I love your soul. I love, I love where you're going with this. And uh, I just thank you so much. Anything you'd like to say about, uh, you'd mentioned a couple of times, the spiritual and uh, uh, philosophical, you know, th th what you'll be focusing on the next year. Any further little teasers along those lines and anything you'd like to say in conclusion? Oh, well, maybe I'll just uh, mention um, the uh, This Civilization is Finished uh, book. Um, which uh, touches on some of these issues and, and, and gives a kind of sense of some of where I, I think of myself as, uh, uh, as, as going. Um, but really, um, this is very much work in progress, and I hope to be uh, teaching on it and, uh, and lecturing on it over the coming year, uh, assuming that is that I'm not uh, in prison. Uh, which is always a possibility, <laughs> somebody strongly involved in Extinction Rebellion. But if I'm in prison, then, uh, then I hopefully I'll still be doing it uh, uh, there as well. So watch this space. <laughs> That's great, Rupert. Well, thank you so much. I'm delighted to have this face-to-face -face, uh, conversation with you. Uh, all right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Yeah, Cheers. Bye -bye.